What's up, everybody? Sunday Sessions, episode 46. Welcome to the Amazon Lit YouTube channel. My name is Eric Castellano, and if this is your first time here, welcome. We do some sessions every single week. It's an opportunity for you to ask questions, grow your business, and thrive. How's everybody Sunday going? Doing anything exciting? I just did some gardening on my balcony. So this past weekend, I went to an amazing Amazon event. It was called SellerCon. It was my first time going. It's actually the first time they've had it since 2018 due to COVID and shutdowns and all of that. But wow, what an experience. And I'm telling you guys and girls all the time, go to events, right? It's where you're going to be able to network, learn what's trending, learn what's working. So invest in yourself, invest in yourself, travel to an event. I'm telling you, it's going to change the entire game for you. It really will. Like this weekend, all in between me and Sebastian, we both got hotels, airfare, tickets to the event. You figure maybe it was like $4,000 for the, for the, for the four day trip. And that's not including, like we rented out a bar for Amazon Lit and the eSellers Ride community. That's not including that. That's just like flying there, hotel food, four or 5,000 bucks. I'm gonna get an ROI. I've got an ROI immediately, immediately, just the things I learned, right? And then implementing it was gonna change the game. So please attend an event, attend one. You got to. Some good ones coming up. Ecom Summit in August in Chicago, ASD, got to go to ASD, amazing. I think for Amazon sellers, especially if you're new, it's phenomenal. Um, and then AMZ United at the end of August. What's up, everybody? Y'all got questions? I'm here to, I'm here to serve. Sunday's my, ser my serving time. Every day's my serving time. Happy Sunday. The liquidation through Amazon, how does that work? Yeah, so we prefer never really to use the liquidation from Amazon. And, and you could just pull it up. If you go to Seller Central, you could look at, they give you a breakdown of an example. Um, and I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna cover it because you could just pop it up on Seller Central. But essentially what it says is that if you have a product that's listed at $20, it's sale price listed at $20 on Amazon and you choose Amazon liquidation services you're gonna get about a dollar back which is crazy a dollar back that's ridiculous that's like five percent right and typically for Amazon cost of goods makes up about 40 to 50 percent of the sale price right so you're losing 90 percent of the set of the cost of goods when you liquidate through Amazon liquidation services so we prefer not to use it because it's it just kills it's like i rather remove it um, especially because if you're donating the inventory what you can do is write off any expense associated with the inventory so let's say you got a ten dollar product and amazon charged you five dollars to remove it you can actually write off embedded in the cost of goods fifteen dollars for that product because it's a cost associated with the shrinkage in your company that's what we prefer to do do i know any lawyer recommendations for taking amazon to arbitration yes yeah, cj rosenbaum try him top three advice for someone to scale up fba advice point number one understand your finances understand your cash flow and your profits and your margins you gotta have a firm grasp on the numbers in your business or you're going to be pumping out a lot of inventory and at the end of the year when you got to pay your taxes you're going to realize you didn't even make as much money as you thought you were going to make because you didn't thoroughly understand your numbers right super important priority number one number two the people i got the data on it these trophies behind me i ship them out every year to hundreds of amazon sellers in our community and it's proven the people are consistent people who show up right? The people who are accountable to their actions and ask questions frequently. Those are the people who continue to thrive. It's just proven. Same reason why I'm up every day, taking action, prioritizing my tasks of what's going to drive business growth first, because all the other stuff, super easy to get caught up in, super easy to get caught in the mundane day-to-day -day tasks that don't drive revenue growth, right? Don't drive profit growth. Some of those things, packaging inventory. You could pay someone 15 to 20 bucks an hour to do that. Is your time more valuable than 15, 20 bucks an hour? I know mine is, certainly is, right? So that's like a task that you should not be doing in your company. You know, anything to have to do with data sorting, virtual assistant, perfect for that. 
right? Now, finding suppliers, virtual assistants, supplier outreach, recognize, uh, recommend having someone in the States. So understanding your numbers, being super consistent, and then branching out. A lot of people get super comfortable in a niche, whether it's shoes or grocery or pet supply. Like I'm not, I never get too comfortable in a niche, right? I never get too comfortable in a category. My goal is to sell literally anything that we can make a couple bucks on. So if that's a patio, baby, outdoor, sporting goods, doesn't matter, uh, industrial and scientific, home, home and health, health and household, home and kitchen, like we're, we're going wide on our category. And that's so we have a, an ample amount of supply to the end consumer, which in turn increases your percentage of your daily buy box. Biggest takeaway from the vent that, that I went to. So I've already been using AI for some of my Amazon listings, as well as finding some suppliers, as well as supplier outreach. Our team's been using AI, but we're gonna go much heavier on AI. Right for product design, um, as well as Sebastian and I, we were talking. You know, we own four or five different private label brands, but the thing is, we created them three to five years ago. You know, and they've just been very consistent ever since then. Very consistent. You know, some do thirty a month, the thirty thousand a month. Some do fifty thousand a month. Some do two thousand a month. You know, and for each private label brand, some of them we have twenty, thirty SKUs underneath that private label brand. But Sebastian and I, we came to the realization like we're living off the work we put in two, three years ago with our private label companies. We haven't developed any new private label products since then. So my takeaway was we're going to start developing some new private label products to add to our wholesale and brand exclusive Amazon account. No, I actually manage all the PPC myself. It's one of the few things I still, still do in my business. I mean, we operate, I think we spend, spend about $15,000 a month at a point or a 6% A cost. So 15,000 divided by 0 0.06. Yeah, so that, that 15,000 in spend brings in about a quarter million dollars in sales. And now keep in mind, half of that 15,000 is paid for by brands that we manage, right? So we're really only putting in 7,000, which is dumb cheap. And if I remove the brand PPC spend, from our PPC spend, our PPC spend is probably closer to two or 3%. That's that's a cost. When you analyze it, tacos, total advertising cost of sales, you're talking a fraction of a penny on every dollar made from advertising, like a 10th of a penny on every dollar made on advertising. It's crazy, it's crazy, right? Because you figure you do 15,000, what do we do? 15,000 divided by Let's just call it 5.5 million. Yeah, it's uh, a fifth of a penny. So one fifth of a penny goes to PPC spend for every dollar in sales revenue. That is crazy. That's nuts. It's nuts. Uh, one of the best tools to use accurate uh, sales prediction, we prefer to use AZ Insight. And then our backup is AMZ Scout, the free version. But we definitely pay for AZ Insight. It's not a question, along with Keepa as well. Cannot use the free version of Keepa. The supplier is a, a deal on a product, but they require to buy two to three months of the product. Would you buy it and store the excess at your warehouse? Because typically I send about 30 days of products. So there's a few things I would need to know before even answering this question and a few things you need to analyze before you can answer this question for yourself. So number one is, do you have any historical sales data from your Amazon account for that product? If it's a brand new product, typically we will not go in and overbuy over that 30 day mark, right? But when we have historical sales data from our account, preferably more than 30 days, anything 90 days plus of sales data, then absolutely we will invest the two or three months in that inventory. But there's a few other things to consider before making that decision. The second one would be how much inventory does the distributor have? Because if they're saying, hey, you can place a special order, let's say it's 5,000 units, and for you that's two to three months of inventory, but they're fulfilling special orders for 10 other people, you know, in a couple of weeks that listing's not gonna look the same because what's gonna happen is the offer count's gonna go up, and what happens when the offer count goes up? Typically the price goes down, right? Basic economics. And then the third thing to consider is cash flow. Do you have the cash flow to leave an extra two months of inventory sitting around in your warehouse? Or how much more valuable would it be if you were to buy some other products 
with that inventory you're about to sit in your warehouse for two to three months, right? And invest in other products that you could simultaneously sell during the same 30 day period to get cash back into your business. So these are all things to consider before we personally make a decision where we're investing enough inventory or enough cash to buy inventory for two to three months out. Seen a lot of people get burned. I personally got burned. And that's why I always run through those three scenarios before I make that decision. You know, an example of that was a buyer came into my my office a couple of days ago and said, Hey, Eric, the MOQ on this product's a thousand units. Should we buy it? I looked at the product. We were making like two, maybe three dollars. So it wasn't terrible, right? Price was very consistent. Everything checked out, but the thousand units was about two or three months of inventory. It was a little aggressive. So one of the first questions I asked her, I said, hey, how much inventory did the supplier tell you how much inventory they had? She said, yeah, they have 15,000 units. I said, absolutely not. It's a no, absolutely not, right? Now for us, it was only a two or $3,000 investment to make two or $3,000, right? Because the product was three bucks. The profit was about two or three bucks. So it wasn't a huge investment for our company, but because I had the knowledge and, and the data that that company that was selling us the inventory had literally 15,000 units, the chance of that price staying consistent or slim to none. Because typically it will drop. It will be on the decline. Because once again, seller count goes up, price goes down. How is your PP so good? Is there a module on it in eSellers or I? Yeah, absolutely. It's the same exact the same exact methodology I use in eSellers or I is, the, is how I get my PPC at 6% literally the same exact, right? It's just important to point out, and this is something that I think is overlooked in the training modules, is the video where I discuss reviewing your campaigns, constantly popping in. I'm popping in at minimum once a week, at the bare minimum. And if I'm setting up a new campaign, I'm popping in two to three times a week to manage the spend, right? It's important. You got to. You can't just set it and forget it. Should I tell distributors or brands I'm an Amazon seller to open up a wholesale account? So typically in the beginning conversation, that's not something we're disclosing. You know, obviously they're going to ask sooner or later and then we disclose it. But you don't want to get you don't want to be immediately judged because that's what happens typically. Right. And the reason it's the same reason why I've shut down my wholesale account. I only deal with certain people is because the new the new Amazon seller. Right. And this is another reason why our training is so important. The new Amazon seller is a nightmare to deal with. You don't understand case packs, MOQs, uh, the difference between a UPC and EIN and a GT, how to submit your orders, um, how to schedule shipping, all those fundamental things that you should have a, a, a hold of or at least a, an understanding of because most new Amazon sellers, they do not understand or grasp those concepts. It makes dealing with them very, very challenging and complicated, right? And I, my wholesale company probably gets five to seven emails a day. And once in a while, I pop into the email and I read them. And it's just a constant reminder of why Amazon sellers suck at the end of the day. I am one and I'm here telling you that a new Amazon seller is a nightmare to deal with because you don't understand the vocabulary or the vernacular and the way to use it and how to really seal these deals. So it's dealing with a novice and, and it makes it complicated for the distributor and the wholesaler on their end to put in all that work for a $1,500 order. It makes it complicated. And I want to see you win. I want to see you succeed. Right? And that's why I do these Sunday sessions and we have our training program and we did a free event in, in Austin the other day. You know, we're like, this is what we do to educate all of you to become better so you can provide for your families and most importantly, obtain time freedom because money's fucking cool. Don't get me wrong. I love money, but something I love more than money is time because without time, it doesn't matter how much money you have. You can't use it. You can't spend it. You can't enjoy it. Yeah, I'm not the guy to ask FBM, man. I haven't sold an FBM product in probably four years, three and a half years. And that was one of the main reasons, because just dealing with the customer, the customer nightmare. of It's just something we stopped doing. But I highly advise doing it, especially if you're new, because it's a quick way to turn around cash, especially in Q4. Also in Q4, you can make some crazy money on the expedited shipping fees. Um, plus, you can literally list the inventory and sell it that's within 10 minutes later of it going live. Um, so if you're just getting started, I encourage you to do FBM, right? At our scale, FBM just doesn't make sense. We ran the numbers on it. I, I ran the data. We can produce so much more and make a lot more money by allocating our time 
to FBA stations as opposed to FBM stations. Yeah, so instead of Amazon seller, I just I just get straight to the point. Hey, my name's Eric Castellano. I'm from Insert Your Company Here. Uh, love to open up a wholesale account. Please send over your catalog and account application, right? Keep it super straightforward, super simple. Don't overcomplicate it. And I guarantee you're gonna send out about 100 of those emails and you'll be lucky and excited if 10 of them respond to you, right? That's also the importance of using a CRM, which most people aren't using either. Right, you use a CRM, you send them the email, you know when they opened it. And if you get that notification and they just opened it, you send an immediate follow-up while they're reading it. So now they're thinking about you, they got your email open on the phone or their desktop, they're reading it, and boom, you hit them with another email. Now they don't know that you got a CRM and that you just saw that they're there, right? It creates the perfect storm, it really does. It's the game changer. And it's the biggest problem that Amazon sellers deal with. And just the other day, I had a call with someone who they just joined Inner Circle at our highest tier, which is a, a six-figure investment. And our original Inner Circle call, where they were on the fence of joining or not, they said, Eric, we need distributors, you know, and we'll pay you for distributors. And I'm like, listen, guys, like, it, that's not something I do. It's not something I offer because it's a broken business model. I give you a good distributor. The distributor runs out of stock. They can't fulfill your orders. They shut your account down, whatever the case may be. You're going to become running back to me for a new distributor. Right? doesn't make sense. just doesn't make sense. Right? And also, emailing distributors, anybody can do that. Brand new seller, super experienced seller. It's all about harvesting the relationship. And harvesting the relationship is on a case-by-case -case basis. Now, obviously, there's just some things that you have to do to harvest the relationship, like be a good person, spend money, properly communicate, right? But each, each relationship is going to be a little different. And that's where most people fail, is harvesting and growing the relationship. Take it back to the beginning of the Sunday sessions. That's why I'm a firm believer in travel. I go to at minimum 12 Amazon events every single year, right? I've already been to three or four in the past couple months. I try to go to one a month at the bare minimum. Some months like August, I'll be at three. It's because you can't put an immediate number, dollar amount on your investment in a trade show, right? Because there's been trade shows I went to three years ago where now I'm opening those accounts, Right. So if you were to be like, ah, I just I went to that show and it didn't work out. I'm never going to an Amazon event again. You're doing yourself a huge disservice. Uh, one of the main really selling in, in the in the US and UK is very, very similar when it comes to Amazon. The biggest difference in, in Europe is the VAT fees. Right. In, in the US, you just do not have VAT. Um, and it's one of the reasons we stopped selling in UK. Well, one of the main reasons because our account got shut down. Um, temporarily and then we got it reinstated but we just stopped the vat but between shipping over from the u.s to the uk because we were selling products sourced in the u.s in uk we we're selling sending full containers after we weighed the cost of shipping which for us at the time we were sending these these full containers to the uk were like i think it was eight or nine thousand dollars might even been more than that it was crazy right and there was only about five thousand units on it so you're looking at two dollars an item you know, and the average margin or average profit dollar amount on that on that shipping was maybe like four to five dollars. So if two dollars is going to shipping, you know, a little bit of competition comes in play. And before you know it, you're breaking even. Yeah. Excited to see you on the call tomorrow, M.M. Also, two quick little update. I will be going to Canada, not tomorrow, Monday, but the following Monday. So I most likely will not be on the East Sauger I call, but we got Trish and Carlos. I just spoke to him before. I'm just waiting for Carlos to get back to me. Um, but they will be manning the the call, right? I'm, I'm at literally, there's 52 calls a year. I'm at, at minimum 50 of them. This is probably, other than when I got back from Vegas and I was super sick, I just don't miss these calls. They're super important to me. Not only do I learn a lot on my own coaching calls from all of you who attend them because you're all so intelligent, you have your own businesses and you're teaching me things, right? Also, I have the capability of helping you guys change your lives, which is fucking win-win for me. Move on. If they're saying they don't sell to Amazon sellers, move on. Put them in your, in your sheet. And, and reach back out in 30 days. And when they say no in 30 days, reach back out again. That comes to point number two, where the gentleman asked the, my top three tips for scaling a business, consistency. A no today simply means a no today. You got no idea what's going on in that person's life. No idea. Could have had a shitty day. Opened your email. They're just like, I'm not, I'm not dealing with this guy today. 
So they said, you know, we're not dealing with any Amazon sellers anymore. Follow up, follow up, and follow through. I guarantee you, you email these guys a bunch of times and they keep telling you no. But if you're going to trade shows, you're going to run into them. And then you're going to walk up to a person and say, hey, it's E. I emailed you like 10, 15 times. I just want to come introduce myself. I know you keep telling me no, you know, but I, I just I want to come meet you in person. I couldn't help myself, but come say what's up. So it's a pleasure to meet you. Is there any opportunity right now? You know, and then run some bullet points of what you can do, what you can provide for them. You know, I can increase um, sales on this listing, this listing. Um, I can make minimum purchase orders, whatever the case may be. I'll take care of advertising to help grow it. Like, don't worry about it. I deal with everything. Right? And then you start to turn those into yeses. But that's what most people aren't doing. Everybody wants a distributor immediately, immediately, immediately. Because how do you know what to sell? What do you use to tell you? Uh, so we like to use UPC scrapers and, a, and a, a Chrome extension called AZ Insight, right? So a UPC scraper will give you a general idea of products that are typically ranked lower, depending on what your prerequisites are that you put in, as well as estimated profits. And then when you pop open the listing, you're able to analyze AZ Insight, plug in your cost of goods, see if you're eligible to sell the product, see if it has any hazmat restrictions, uh, make sure there's no discrepancies in the shipping weight, so you're not getting under or overcharged your fulfillment fees. And then pop open Keepa, look at the ebbs and flows in the Keepa chart, look at the offer count, make sure there's no IP complaints, analyze the lowest consistent price in the past 90 days, even pop it open to a full year. All right, so there's a lot of things to analyze when you're making a buying decision. I was just at this event I was at last weekend. I was talking with this woman, Joy, from, uh, I don't remember her company. It's an Amazon lawyer. I don't remember. But she was saying how she started selling on Amazon back in like 2012, right around when we started. And we got to talking about how there was nothing for us. Like there was no Keepa, there was no sales estimators, there was no profit calculators, there's no UPC scrapers, there's no courses, no YouTube, there was nothing. And that experience early on, I think really allowed my brain to analyze listings at a completely different level, completely different wavelength than most people. Because early on, I had to make educated buying decisions based on no data, literally no data, just a best seller's rank. It's crazy when you think about it. It's crazy. So when I hear people complaining today, it's like, bro, figure it the fuck out. What are you complaining about? Like the resources are out there. It's just excuses. And I personally, in my life, I have no space for excuses. Absolutely zero, zero space for excuses. I made excuses my early 20s. That's my whole life was a fucking excuse. So I don't want to hear shit about your excuses because there's a solution to every problem you have. Absolutely, there's a solution to every problem you have, but when you don't know what you don't know, it's impossible to implement it. So this gentleman's question, Jake, was do you work with brokers or do you buy only from wholesalers that own the stock? So I we did early on, we did do some broker purchases. The only thing you want to communicate back to, uh, I forgot, tech news question before, if you're dealing with a broker, you definitely want to know how much inventory they have access to, which typically they don't want to share that information. Um, and you also want to know what their lead times are. Because typically a broker, what they're doing is they're taking, you know, a 40 to 60% down payment. Let's just call it 50%. So you place an order with them. They take the 50% down payment. They buy the inventory, right? It takes whatever, two to three weeks, typically uh, a broker's two to four week lead time to process it and ship it to you. And then when it ships, you send the other 50% of payment, right? So what can happen in four weeks with an Amazon listing, we all know what can happen. Typically the price can go very low, you know, especially if you didn't ask the question of how much inventory they have. So it's important. So brokers are not, a, a definitely, I wouldn't say don't deal, don't deal with them, don't do business with them, just be mindful. Right? And try to build a good relationship with the broker because there's some deals that pop up that typically they will only have access to because back to the relationships, they've been in the game for 15, 20 years. So, yes, there is opportunity. Just be mindful. Uh, no, we do not use any cash and carry suppliers. Really over here in the East Coast, there aren't many, or at least in the Northeast, there's not many cash and carry suppliers. Typically, cash and carry is like a Midwest thing. Um, you see it a lot in like Texas. And uh, I actually know a guy who owns a cash carry down in Houston. 
And what he does is he backdoors any profitable goods onto Amazon himself. So they're not even making it to the floor. And if you and if they're on the floor, they're usually priced a little higher, so nobody can come in and buy them and sell them on Amazon. Best way to get your foot in the door with a distributor is place some orders, spend some money. If they're willing to send you a catalog and you run the numbers and you know, uh, listen, an average Amazon wholesale business operates between 15 and 20, maybe 22 percent gross margins, right? Gross margins is after all Amazon feeds, not including any business expenses like labor, rent, shipping, um, software, anything like that. Right. Typical gross margins for Amazon wholesale business, 15 to 22 percent. So in order to place an order. With a supplier, sometimes you got to go a little lower than those 15 to 20% to get your foot in the door, to let them know that you're not that new guy who's just trying to skim for the two or three profitable products, spend the bare minimum with them, right? And, and not really harvest any relationship growth. So in the beginning, I'm comfortable taking a lower gross margin to show my commitment, right? Because most people aren't willing to do that. And now here's the thing. If you're just getting started and you only got two, three thousand bucks, then you can't do that. You just it's not possible for you right? because you're trying to turn that inventory. So in that case, you need to focus on finding a supplier or two or maybe even a retail or an online store where you can start turning that cash to make some more cash. So then you can go making those purchase orders where maybe you're only at a 13, 14 percent gross. And after expenses, you know, you're still making a dollar, dollar fifty in, in net profits because I'm, I'm a firm believer in volume. I'm a volume guy, you know, and I know someone just joined eSellers Ride just a couple of days ago and she had zero sales. Right? She just joined, just started selling on Amazon. She found a heavy hitter skew. Boom. Three hundred dollars first day in sales, seven hundred dollars second day in sales. Like thousand bucks in two days because she found a, a heavy hitter skew. And yeah, profit margin, let's just call it 20% before expenses. So she made 200 bucks off those sales. And really it's a it's a zero for her, right? Because it, she's just getting started. It's just getting started. She's gonna reinvest that money back into inventory. So then it's get the snowball effect. It just starts building up on each other. Yeah, no, I'm sending contracts to any brand that I'm getting exclusive with. Hell yeah. And I provide the contract that we use in eSellers or I. Same contract I've locked in, easy 15, 20 million dollars worth of brand direct deals. And hell yeah, I'm making them sign a contract. I'm not putting in all that work just for them to go sell the five or six other Amazon sellers. It'd be a nightmare for me. It's a lot of work building, building, building brands on Amazon. The shit's not easy. And if you're sitting here questioning why you haven't signed an exclusive yet. Like, don't beat yourself up. We didn't start getting exclusive deals till we were like four or five years in, maybe even longer. Might have been year five, right? Figure 2013, yeah, it was probably like 2018, 2019, we got our first exclusives, right? A, because there's nobody to teach us the shit. We had to figure it out ourselves. B, nobody was really doing it except for Amazon through their one piece services and then brands themselves. I'm dealing with this brand right now. Well, we're dealing with two. Sebastian, in the past two weeks, we, we just signed on this brand new brand who owns, it's almost like a conglomerate, and they own like seven pretty decent sized brands. And Sebastian, just in the past two weeks, literally created 105 brand new listings on Amazon. Ain't, gonna, ain't nobody putting in work like that. Ain't nobody putting in work like that. I don't care what you tell me. And, and he, I, when he told me, I couldn't even believe it. Right. Ain't nobody putting in work like that. And why? Because it's not easy. It's not easy to do, but it's also not impossible. Same thing with me. I'm dealing with a brand now. They wanted me to update all their brand storefront, all their EBC. They got brand new listings or photos of all of their products. I had to update all their images. Right. And I'm still in the process. I've been doing this for 45 days. It's a lot of work. You're talking about dozens and dozens of listings and updating all the information. And then what they do is they pop in and then they want changes. It's fucking tedious. And if you don't know what you're doing, it's going to make it very complicated because anybody can whip up a listing, but does it have phenomenal images? Does it have a great infographics? Got some lifestyle shots. How's the SEO in the title? Is it embedded with keywords? Does the description have embedded keywords? What about the bullet points? Are there keywords in that as well? Right? Are there any pain points that the customer or, or either your competitor's customer or your customer's complained about in the past? 
And are you putting those pain points all over that listing? So people know when they're about to buy it that this, this product doesn't do this. It doesn't perform poorly in this respect anymore, right? So if you're doing those things and you're capable of doing those things, absolutely lock into some brand exclusives. If not, I encourage you to learn more about selling on Amazon. When buying inventory, what is your minimum sales per month you typically look for? Oh, we have a unit minimum and it's just for efficiency in our warehouse and it's 24 units. Typically we will not, we will not buy less than that, but that's also at our scale. Early on, we would go as low as six, sometimes 12 units, but also depends on the profit as well. It's like, there's no blanket statement. And I try to train, well, I don't try to, I do train my buyers on this all the time. Like anything I say, it's not a blanket statement. There's always those exceptions, right? And that's why it takes an intuitive thinker to be really good at being an Amazon buyer. It really does. Someone who thinks outside of the box, because you could set up these prerequisites in your company. Minimum $2.50 profit and 10% gross margin, right? Minimum 150 sales per month, maximum seven sellers, minimum three. But like there's always some leeway in there, you know, because each listing is analyzed on its own. It's its own little movie that you can expand and review and analyze the data to make an educated buying decision. So it's important to have a team of buyers or yourself, which I know a lot of you are still buying for your company. And I encourage you to do that. It's the most important part of your entire business. It's the person buying the inventory. If they're not buying good inventory, then you don't have a business. You're just moving products to move products. And nobody likes to do that. But having an intuitive thinker and allowing them to be a free thinker as well. Right? Allowing them to make mistakes instead of beating them up about mistakes, bringing them to your office and training them exactly why they made the mistake, what data they missed and the reason why it happened. And then showing them the proper way to analyze that information. Right. I was listening to Alex Hormozzi. He had a bit of a real or maybe it was a YouTube video. I don't know. I watched the guy a lot. But um, he was talking about how one of his employees made a mistake that cost him, I forgot, it was a lot, maybe fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 in like one day, right? And he said he didn't fire that employee. And I completely agree with that sentiment because th you cannot train that mistake. Like that person made that mistake and I guarantee you they will never make that mistake ever again. They are now a superior employee because you've allowed them to work through that mistake make it move on and become better at their job. Now, if they make that mistake again, they got to go. They got no space in your company if they're making the mistake twice. You know, when we work the same way with our buyers, we let them make mistakes. Because I know I'm human. I make mistakes. I buy products that we get killed on. For one of the brands we manage, I created a listing, three listings, one pack, two pack, three pack. In order to get it manufactured from overseas, I had to commit to 6,000 cases, which was or no, I apologize, it was 1,000 cases, six units in each. So I had to commit to get it manufactured to 6,000 units. And I created three brand new listings for that had no sales traction, brand new, literally brand new. Long story short, sold through about 4,000 of them. The other 2,000 expired while they were in inventory and the product weighed about three pounds. So in order to dispose of it, not only did I lose the 3,000 the three dollars times the two thousand units. So what's that? Six thousand bucks I lost on the cost of inventory. But then it was another three thousand dollars to dispose of the inventory because it expired in, in Amazon. So now you're looking at you know nine to twelve thousand dollar loss. And that was me. I made that mistake. You know, and I've been doing this shit for nine years. It's part of the game. I'll never make it again. I'll never commit to having a thousand cases of something manufactured and I didn't test it, right? But it's because of the relationship, the, the guy. And he ended up working me a little. He reimbursed me some of the money, but I took a risk and I knew the risk I was taking. Do I regret taking it? Absolutely not. Uh, what I mean, for example, if a case is 12, but the listing will only sell four units a month at a decent profit, would you buy it or is the sales velocity too low? It's too low. It's too low because then you're buying three months of inventory. So let's just say it's a high ticket product, right? Because we, we sell some four or $500 products where, where our profit is, you know, 80, 120 bucks, right? So even then, if it's only selling four a month, you got to buy 12, you know, now you got two extra months of inventory just sitting around collecting dust. 
when you could have reinvested that money into other products and sold them simultaneously. Windstar asks, is it worth it to audit Amazon disbursements and reconcile their payments, or can I rest assured I'm getting paid the right amount? I mean, as far as disbursements and reconciliation, I mean, you could audit it, but it's going to be it's going to be a lot of legwork on your end. Um, something I do recommend is using uh, companies like Seller Investigators. Uh, what's another one? Sifted is another one, which I believe Scott created many years ago, and then I think he sold it. Might have a different name. There's a few of them out there, but essentially what they'll do is they will kind of essentially do that on a. They're not going to go through your. Uh, well, they will. They will to an extent, right? They're looking for discrepancies that Amazon made mistakes in, right? Return, shipping fees, lost inventory, damaged inventory. So they're going to do a lot of that legwork for you, right? So I highly recommend, um, and the one I would say is probably Seller Investigators, um, which is owned by Carbon6. I'm actually going to Cancun on Wednesday. It just kind of happened. Booked the flight a couple days ago. My girl's sister, her and her family were going to Cancun for a quinceanera, and they were going to bring their parents, not my girl's parents, but her brother-in-law's parents, but they canceled last minute. So they called us, and they're like, hey, you go book a flight to Cancun on Wednesday? I was like, say less, booked it up. And then I'm sitting at my computer working today, and, and United upgraded us to first class. That's the move, too. Right. First of all, if you never fall first class, I highly recommend it. It's just an experience. And then you'll never be able to walk by those first class people ever again and not want to be in first class. Um, second is something I like to do is, listen, I don't buy first class tickets everywhere I go. It's just ridiculous. Like, for example, Austin, the, the ticket was like round trip was maybe 500, 600 bucks. Right. But then the first class ticket to Austin was $1,800, right? But the first class ticket home from Austin was like three, 399 or something, right? On checkout. So I was like, all right, the 399 one, I know it's gonna get less. So I didn't purchase it immediately, waited two or three days, hopped into United app, got the, got the, the flight home first class ticket for like 250, right? And the, the flight there was still like a thousand bucks. So it dropped like 200, $300 or, seven or eight hundred dollars i don't know what it dropped but it dropped and long story short i flew out to austin in business class not first class right and then i flew home in first class so um, also right before the flight typically the price of first class will go very low and if you fly fly frequently they'll give you updates or upgrades rather like this flight to cancun i didn't have to pay for first class but they upgraded me and Catherine, so i'm cool with that um, I'm new to Amazon. I need help. I have a set I want to send, but it's 10 inches long and three inches wide. It's a box. Can I wrap it or do I have to use a poly bag? So first thing to consider is what's Amazon's prep services for the item or prep guidance rather. So when you go to add the item to a shipment, it will tell you what Amazon requires to prep it. So if it says poly bag, then you have to put it in a poly bag. Now, if it doesn't say that there's any prep guidance for it, then you are able to make that decision. But typically, if it's a multi-pack, it will need to be in a poly bag. But if it's just that box, right? So here's an example. If it's just that 10 inch long, three inch wide box, and you're sending multiple boxes, and that one 10 inch wide, three inch long, or 10 inch long, three inch wide box is one ASIN, Right, what I would do is take multiple of those boxes and put them in a bigger box. You could put them into a box that's no greater than 25 inches on any of its sides and no heavier than 50 pounds. Right? So you could throw them in all those little 10 inch long, three inch wine boxes into a bigger box. You just got to make sure that you label them with FN SKUs and maybe even do not separate stickers depending how it's packaged, the box. And then you would slap a box label and a 2D label, which isn't required um, on the, what the box label is on the outside of the shipment and you send it off to Amazon. Oh, it's a three pack. So then yeah, if it's a three pack, you'll need to poly bag it. If it's three of those boxes, unless the three, so many questions. So many questions for this super easy question. So many questions from my end, because there's a lot of things to consider here. So if the three units are already in that 10 inch long and three inch wide box, then I would put the FN skew and a do not separate label and send it in a bigger box with a bunch of those, right? But if it's 10 inch 
long three inch wide box, three of them, then you poly bag. All right, my friends, this has been amazing. I appreciate you all. Have a beautiful rest of your Sunday. Um, we'll see some of you on tomorrow night's live call. East sellers are all right. Keep grinding. Keep doing what you enjoy doing. And have a beautiful rest of your day. Catch you on the flip side. Stay with my friends.